All right, well, uh, hello, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's my uh, very great pleasure to welcome you all to this physique management webinar, where over the next hour, we will be discussing injury management in rugby uh, with some insight from the practitioner side uh, and from the athlete's perspective. Um, and we are hugely grateful to Cardiff Blues for allowing us time with two of their very best this evening. Uh, senior physiotherapist, Griff Parsons, and Welsh international wing, a score of 17 tries in 32 appearances, uh, Mr. Josh Adams. Uh, applause, applause, applause. Well done, everybody. Um, now, for anyone unfamiliar with Physique, they are suppliers of sports healthcare products to medical professionals, consumers and elite sports teams, and have been doing so for over 20 years. Football, rugby, cricket, lacrosse, netball, speedway, hockey, athletics. You will have seen physios running onto pitches, tracks, courts and fields uh, with the physique medical bags. And if you haven't seen them, well, trust me, you will now I've mentioned it. Um, Griff, Josh, thank you very much for being with us. Um, Josh, first of all, how are you? Very good, thanks. Yourself? Excellent. Yeah, very good, thank you. Is it is it a weekend off for you this weekend? Uh, yeah, there's no game this weekend, actually. So bank holiday, lovely. Excellent, tidy. Uh, and uh, and Griff, how's uh, how's the week been for you? Yeah, good. Um, but a bit of a shorter week this week um, due to the sort of break in the game. So um, no, it's been a successful week so far. So uh, yeah, looking forward to a weekend. Uh, yeah, hopefully in the sunshine. Excellent. Well, um, for any of you who uh, who may be unfamiliar with myself, uh, my name is Nick Heath, and I'm a commentator and journalist on uh, on the game of rugby union. Um, you will have heard me across the Women's Six Nations, across the Gallagher Premiership, Champions Cup on Channel Four, and various other places. Uh, some of you may also have been quizzing with me through lockdown. Yes, I've been doing a bit of that as well. Diversifying, as most of us have over the course of the last year. Um, now then, if you have any questions, um, then feel free to pop them in the Q&A section. Uh, if you are watching via the webinar, um, I, uh, I appreciate that we had such a, a brilliant sign up that we've got many of you tuning in uh, live across YouTube and Facebook. You are very welcome with us as well. Uh, you can put your questions in and the uh Fabulous elves here at uh, Physique will make sure that those questions get through to us. But uh, if you're on the webinar, pop them into the Q&A box. And if it's relevant as we go, I'll do my best to try and draw them out at that point. Um, but uh, but otherwise, we'll get to a few of them towards the end. So we're here until about seven o'clock. Um, thanks again for joining us. Um, and uh, well, gents, perhaps Josh, uh, maybe I can start with you. Um, from the start of your playing career to now then, um, which, uh, you know, what are you, 26, so hopefully many years ahead, um, but how has your view of the role of the medical team and, and the physios changed from, from when you were a youngster? Um, it's a good question. Obviously, playing club level, you probably allocated, you know, one physio twice a week um, for training days and then on a Saturday. So, it, you know, it, it can be quite difficult maybe to to see the physio for any sort of niggle you might have picked up um, playing for your local club or any lower level sort of rugby. But um, as, as, as I've progressed through my career, um, I've got nothing but good things to say about the physio care, um, the medical care I've received. Every professional setup I've been involved in, you know, I've had two, three full-time uh, physiotherapists and they've been fantastic. Um, I think their job probably includes a lot more than just sort of treatment um, uh, in, in, in the modern game. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll touch on it later on regards to um, rehabilitation and things like that. But mm -hmm. um, it's come on leaps and bounds from where I was to where I am now at the Cardiff Blues, where we have a fantastic medical team. Yeah, I'm sure. And, uh, and Griff, I mean... Can you set your watch by a player's relationship with you, depending on their age or or the moment they might have a big injury or, or that niggle that won't go away? Does that relationship sort of start to change? The relationship is key. And I, and I think, like, I, well, I'd like to think, anyway, the, the key traits really in, in successful physios are those who got the ability to build relationships quickly with, with players. It's so, so vital to be able to, to gain rapport quickly. Um, because, you know, you, you live in these injuries with these lads and you're getting very close to them. Um, there's one, one injury in particular recently. I spent more time with him than I certainly did with my wife, you know, over the past sort of couple of years, really. So, um, you know, it's important that you do get on, on well um, and you go through the highs and lows with them as well. And, and, and you very much sort of um, engage and, and invest sort of emotionally in, in it all. 
definitely. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so, Josh, in terms of working on injury prevention, which I guess is yeah. something when you start playing, you imagine that you're only going to have to work on injuries when you have them. But but it quickly becomes apparent that actually, you know, the prevention side of it is a huge part. What are the what are the challenges, perhaps, and the benefits in terms of what you get at elite rugby level where that's concerned? Injury prevention is is massive, um, and to be honest with you, it was only something really introduced to myself. Um, in the latter stages uh, that I was at Worcester, so the, probably the last two years where we mm. sort of had the individual IDPs things um, where any niggles that we picked up in previous seasons, um, any, any sort of body part that we're struggling with, you know, managing week to week, it was lit, small exercises, little and often, not so much, you know, big half hour rehab sessions, but it was 15 minutes before a gym session or, uh, 15 minutes before a field session. So that injury prevention stuff, then uh, things you can do um, on your own, basically, you know, you can get a sheet from the physio, all physios now provide them sort of things for you. You can get um, a list of things you need to do and you can just crack on with yourself. Um, for myself, um, I found only probably the past six months, I found yoga really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um there's an app on your, your your smartphone that anybody could get. It's called Down Dog. It's um it's it's, it's a yoga app, um, and you can set the time. What 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 sort of yoga um um you, you can do? It it also lists any body parts that you find maybe giving you trouble or you know you find stiff, um, and you know it focuses on them areas. So for me, really, the past six months since we've um went into sort of that second lockdown um, around November time. I think it was in December. I've been, uh, I've been trying to keep on top of the yoga for two, three times a week if possible. Um, and I found that really, really helpful. So um, I'd really encourage people to try that. I've, I found myself feeling a lot better in, in, in myself. I feel refreshed. Um, my recovery is come on leaps and bounds now with all the other little bits and bobs that I'm doing. Um, mm. And I'm finding myself training at a much higher intensity, surprisingly, actually, to myself, it was that I'm um, training a lot higher intensity and I feel much better out on the field as well from it. And do you think there's any difference in the fact that, you know, talking about the yoga, for example, something that you've obviously found yourself, um, perhaps through the atmosphere of lockdown and that kind of thing, but but through finding it yourself sort of self-motivating in that way, has that felt it? you know, I don't know, you know, felt, felt like something that you can do more positively because you brought something to it yourself. It's, it's not a list of exercises you've been handed by your physio. In some way. Yeah, it is. It is in some ways, you know, different things work for different people. And I'm not saying yoga will work for everybody, but that's what I found has been the most beneficial for me and my body. Um, you know, I, I picked up niggles in the past where I've needed information. I've needed, um, things to work on uh, because I wouldn't have been able to, to do it myself. So, you know, that's where obviously the physiotherapist, therapist, sorry, um, help out, but, mm -hmm. you know, trying different things I thought was um, a good way for me to have my own little thing to do. Um, you know, I can do this yoga thing um, in the house. Usually I, I do it after, after sessions or in the evenings, just a quick 30, 45 minutes if I can. Um, but yeah, I, I just advise trying different things. And you will find something that works for you and you definitely notice a difference. Yeah. So, so Griff, then picking up from that, I mean, how much do you have, you know, with, with your physio hat on, how much is it a case of, well, OK, let, let's find out what you are doing and if it's beneficial or you need to be doing what we've specifically set you. Yeah, um, no, is, when you, it, when you hear it, about doing this. Yeah, absolutely. No, is it, is it, we, we encourage players to, to certainly be proactive. And I think if it's, one sentence for any sort of amateur athletes listening, um, or you know, for, for clinicians to tell their athletes is being proactive, not reactive. And 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 the key is there is to stop the injury from happening rather than having to react to the injury having happened. Um, and so that would be a big take-home message, really. And and I think like we obviously t try and tailor individual prehabilitation sort of sessions to players based on their past medical history, um, as well in some circumstances based on certain tests that we may do in, in pre-season, or although that's sort of going out of fashion a little bit at the moment. But um, certainly where, wherever possible, we encourage the lads to be proactive, um, go out, try Pilates, yoga, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and yeah, the, the, the more the better. The, the, it's, 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 it's amazing, actually. Um, the, the, the one thing I've seen over the years and the players such as Josh, who you know, reached the top of the game, the one common denominator, without doubt, um, with those guys who reach the, the, the very top is their, their proactive um, sort of attitude to things. They are the guys that will be first in the gym. Josh is one of the guys who will be quietly warming up before gym sessions on his own, just chipping away, chipping away on days off, doing the right recovery strategies. There's, there's no coincidence then they go on to play for the country and perhaps beyond. So, so certainly being proactive rather than reactive is, is, is an important thing to remember. I'd say I'm one of the first people warming up on the side of a touch pitch, but that's because I'm 42 and my warm-up <laughs> got longer and longer uh, every time I've gone along. Um, we've got a question, actually, a few questions, some of which uh, uh, I'll get to a little later, but actually one that's relevant now, David Patmore-Hill says, and this is, you know, picking up off, off perhaps wanting people to be proactive, but actually, you know, how you control that in a way, because he says, how hard is it to stop players looking and reading online which could be finding an incorrect approach to rehab or prehab. Absolutely. I mean, for us in particular, we're, we're fortunate because we're in a full-time environment. And, and one of the most important things for us, our roles, is, is education. Um, so we're very lucky that we're able to sort of manage it and we have very open dialogue with the players. You know, the, the medical room is the hub of the chat at the club. So it's, it's, it's you know, things are openly discussed and, Ideas are sort of, you know, weighed up positives versus negatives, etc. I guess where it becomes difficult, um, sort of at more grassroots level, um, I can imagine, you know, sort of with a, a club where you're only having contact perhaps two nights a week, it is very difficult to, to, to manage that. Th there are certain sort of websites out there that, that, that certainly are um, evidence-based and, and I'd encourage really any physios that are working in sport to try and delving and, 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 and maybe educating themselves and creating certain sort of information sheets to, to be given out to players to help them. Because it's the same as all of us. If, if, we, if we're suffering from a sign or a symptom, the next thing we do is we Google it. And, and it's a very dangerous thing. So trying to get a sort of quality assured website, and they are out there, is, is, is very, very important. Yeah, Josh, have you got any teammates that have uh, looked up crazy witch doctors to solve particular uh, ailments? <laughs> don't I don't know of any personally, but um, I know there was a New Zealand player who broke his leg and he went over to Fiji and had some uh, magic leaves and he, yeah. he was fit. He, he was fit in five months. So I don't know. Maybe we can look into that. I don't know. Don't, don't knock it, I guess, is the answer. Um, <laughs> Griff, I mean, a player like Josh will go from club to country, back and forth. You've got experience. Obviously, Cardiff Blues presently, you've been with Team England at the Commonwealth, worked with England Sevens. How do you manage um, players in, in whichever role you happen to have at the time, bearing in mind they, they could be going from one team to another at the elite level? Yeah, and that, that is a challenge. And unfortunately, you know, for us, the Blues, we've got very close ties with the, with the medical team at the, at the Union. The dialogue is, is, is every, every week. Um, there's a phone call that goes around to the head medical, uh, heads of medical, um, you know, wanting to know information about where, where people are at, etc. And when they go into camp, there, there's certainly, you know, programs are sent over and the communication is, is gold standard. So we are, we are lucky in that, in that sense. Um, obviously, uh, the, main, the main sort of differences between the, the medical teams, I guess, is in the campaign, it can get very, very intense. Um, and they, the, the medical teams within those sort of setups are dealing very much with acute and subacute sort of injuries. So they're trying to turn players around very, very quickly. Whereas in, in the clubs, um, perhaps we have more time, say, with, with a longer term injured. Um, mm -hmm. And they're very, di very different approaches, um, you know, doing an accelerated sort of return to play versus a, uh, perhaps someone who's had an ACL and they're, they're out for, for, for nine to 12 months. So there's a lot of crossover, certainly. Um, and, 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 and without doubt, you know, the same sort of skill sets are used. However, I guess the, the, the being in, a, in that sort of high performance, high pressure environment, um, does has his own challenges, um, which, which are very different to club, week on week grind. Yeah, 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 understood. Um, well, Josh, when injury strikes, um, we know it can feel like a lonely place doing a rehab away from the majority of the squad. Um, yeah. You had an ankle injury last year, didn't you? You had surgery after the Six Nations um, yeah. and then lockdown hit. Um, yeah. tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so um, 2026 Nations, just before COVID struck us um, against France, I done an injury called a syndesmosis injury um, in my right ankle. So um, Griff, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I have four ligaments in my right ankle. Um, I couldn't tell you the, the specific names of them, but uh, I snapped the top two um, whilst playing. Um, so, yeah, I was diagnosed with a syndesmosis injury and um, that required surgery. So um, I had two, they call it a tightrope. I had two tight ropes put in to sort of replace the two snapped ligaments um, and a plate on the side to uh, hold that together. So um, it's a quite successful uh, surgery. Um, it's quite common in, in, in rugby as well, that sort of injury. Um, and yeah, because of, because of that, alluding to, to what I was saying earlier, you know, I've, I've, had to, I've had to make sure I keep on top of that injury more or less every day because um, of, of, of the severity of the injury, really. That mm. if you if you don't keep on top of it post return into play, it, it can creep up and you can cause stiffness, um, maybe a bit of soreness as well. So that's vitally important that I sort of keep that going. Um, and I'll probably have to keep that going for the rest of my career and maybe beyond, um, uh, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, but yeah, after um, after that injury, COVID struck us and I was uh, I was at home and I, I was forced to do the the rehab process, really, the majority of the rehab process um, at home, the, you know, the, the, the thick of it, the, 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 the real tough part, really, at home. And um, I, I had fantastic help from everyone at the Blues. I was in dialogue with Griff and Dan more or less every other day, um, making sure I was doing the right things, sending videos frequently of um, the different exercise I was doing. The Blues were kind enough as well to supply me with the majority of the rehab equipment that I needed you know as the club was being closed um, you know the equipment was just going to sit there so um, the, the Blues um, facilitated me with a lot of the rehab equipment I did and um, I could just sort of crack on with it uh, in the house and in the garden I was doing pogo hops down my drive sending videos of myself doing that um, so yeah it was it was a tricky process because I, without sort of being on FaceTime to the physios or anything like that you're sort of on your own um, mm. but thankfully I, I haven't had any issues with it since. Well, that's good. Well done. You did your homework. I mean, was it, we, we heard from lots of people over the course of last year and, and I think, you know, the, the 2021 story in terms of people's mental health is probably yet to really be fully told, I imagine, yeah. as we go forward, but, but certainly in terms of having to do that rehab on your own, you know, although the boys might be out on the field, at least they're within earshot, aren't they? If you're in the team gym, that kind of thing. Of course, this is, yeah. this is an environment where you would have been much more on your own. So that mental challenge of feeling a little bit detached was probably even greater, was it? In some ways, yes. Um, but then again, you know, with, with COVID, I knew everybody was in the same boat, um, being stuck at home, you know, fit or, 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 or injured, um, you know. So in, in some ways that did help, you know, knowing that, I, you know, I wasn't missing out by not being in the club or missing out by not being around all the boys. So um, that sort of did help. The motivational part was probably the hardest part for me, you know, you go into the club every day, you have your schedule and when you're injured, you have your rehab programme and you're set on certain times, you know, you need to be in this place and et cetera, et cetera. So you're there, you have to do it, you know, you're, the physio's with you, guiding you through it. But when you're, you're in your house on your own, you know, you could go two or three days and be like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow or, you know, um, and just keep pushing it back. So being motivated to get yourself right for when rugby did return, um, was was the was the biggest factor for me, and I did find it difficult at times to really just get up um, and sort of crack on with it. Yeah, pogo down the drive or another episode of of something on Netflix. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's obviously the inevitable question. Griff is is about that that engagement, that motivation. That Gabrielle Lang has put a question in, which is right on right on the money for where we're at in the, in the chat now. What would you say are key pointers in keeping players engaged and sticking to their rehab program? Do you know what the the one thing I I'd say I've, I've learned over the years, and certainly try to problem solve this over the years, is we're very very aware that when players are, are chronically injured, that they sometimes can be isolated from the playing group. 
and, and I, do, I do urge, you know, individuals working at clubs, um, perhaps, you know, especially at grassroots level, just to bear that in mind. Um, so, so what, what's ending up, what ends up happening is, is those individuals can sort of feel, you know, that they're on their own, that they're, they're, they're literally, um, in the gym with other injured lads. They don't, they, they're not aware of what's going on in terms of field sessions in, in terms of perhaps what the developments on the tactical side are, et cetera. And, and sometimes because of the, the way that perhaps the scheduling or the facility may, may sort of run, they, they never cross paths with, with, with the fit lads. And it's trying to find a way really to ensure their integration is, is still happening on that front. And, and it is a real challenge if, you, if the facilities are dictating you know, your ability to do that. So that, that's certainly one thing I'd, I'd urge people to really consider that the being injured can be a very, very lonely place. And if you've done, like I mentioned, ACL earlier, you could be out for up to sort of 12, 12 months, even beyond that. So it's, it's, it's a really important thing to, 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 to think about when, when planning and organizing things. Certainly here at the, the Blues, we're very fortunate we come under the WRU umbrella. Um, there's an excellent psychologist we use, Dale Thomas at the D WRU, um, who, who helps our a long term um, injured, and and we've we you know as as everyone has over the past couple of years identified mental health being a particular issue in in high performance sport, so it's just trying to really ensure that you know we're, we're supporting the lads both in terms of providing services like that, but also simple things like in a rehab plan the importance of setting goals whether it's short term long term the importance of th having things like rest weeks. Um, so, you know, allowing within your schedule um, for, for lads to be able to get away, perhaps into the sunshine um, or, you know, just some time away from 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 the club as well. Um, and occasionally, if if the sort of schedule works right, then we do give them a bit of leeway then also to sort of have a have a night out as a group um, and behave, behave themselves, obviously. Um, but, but, you know, things like that, does the world a good to that rehab group? And actually, they, 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 they can become a little uh, sort of population in themselves. And they you know, for, form tight uh, friendships so, during these injuries. Mm. Yeah, I think what, uh, what certainly amateur athletes I know will turn around and say, you know, it's, it's knee rehab club. Um, and we're off, we're off for pizza because you're all training tonight, whatever it might be. I mean, the, the mental side of it's interesting, isn't it? Because I've got, I've got friends who are physios. My niece is an aspiring physio. Um, and I imagine, you know, few people when they enlist to become a physio fully take on board perhaps how much mental support you then end up, you know, requiring to learn how to give. How have you found, Griff, developing that side to your role throughout your career? Is a, is a really, really good point there. Um, fortunately for, for myself, I, I, I was sort of exposed to a lot of, of that type of theoretical work at university and, and, and on completing the sports medicine masters. They, they covered that quite well in Cardiff Met, where I did my, uh, my masters a few years back. But, but, but you're right, you, you, you sort of, you're thrown in the deep end without necessarily the sort of skill set that that perhaps one would expect you, you'd have. And, and it is important in that time is that you lean on your multidisciplinary team. As I, as I touched on with, with, with the use in, um, using people like Dale, the psychologist, but also others around you. I think the key to being a good practitioner is the ability to ask others for, for support. And, and, and perhaps if you feel you haven't got that skill set, then someone else within your medical team or within the wider multidisciplinary team um, could well have. And as a collective, you come and, 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 and you know, you support the athlete. And, and, and the last sort of point on this, I guess, is what I've learned over the years as well is the importance of including the athlete in these conversations, um, making it sort of an athlete-centered approach is so important. So things like having regular meetings as a multidisciplinary team with the athlete, these case conferences, and actually asking the athlete, how, how are things? How do you feel? How do you feel this process is going? What could mm -hmm. be better? And, and some, you know, I, I'll be honest, there's, I've, I've done this type of thing for, for many years. And some of the conversations can be very uncomfortable if the athletes are unhappy, et cetera, et cetera. But without that, without that critical sort of review and without that growth mindset, things won't change and the player will remain unhappy and, and you'll only find out at the end of the process. So, yeah, certainly leaning on, on others and, and communicating with the athlete and listening to the athlete is, is absolutely imperative for that. Yeah, okay, good stuff. Um, I want to come on to 
you mentioned it a little bit there, but um, but on the kind of you know goal setting, managing expectation, and I guess each of you will will have an answer here. So I'll, I'll come to you first, Josh. I mean, athletes always want to be out there uh, quicker than they're told they will be, understandably. Um, how have you found you know following goal setting helping you in terms of managing your expectation of, of when you might be be fit again and ready to go? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, majority of athletes. Well, the first thing they do when they ask, well, sorry, the first thing they do when they ha- have an injury is ask, right, how long am I going to be out for? How long until this is better? How long before I can get back training? Um, and, you know, sometimes a realistic answer is, look, we have a time frame, but it isn't set in stone that this is going to be the exact amount of time. You know, people heal better than others. Things can go better during your rehab, et cetera, et cetera. So, um Setting uh, small short-term goals is is was really helped me. Um, you know, back to my ankle injury, it was first of all it was weight bearing for two weeks, being able to walk without a limp. Then it was being able to walk comfortably without a limp. Then it was being able to jog very slowly. Then jog without a limp. And, you know, these small little bits that you add on, sort of three, four week goals, two, three week goals was massive and you know you you really try and focus yourself home in on making sure that by the end of them three weeks where you've set your goal you're at the point to move on um and i i found that really helpful i was getting my goals in some way set for me by by dan and, and griff um our two uh physios at the at the blues throughout lockdown and you know um that that really did help me moving forward yeah. I mean, do you find inevitably being the competitive animal that you are that if they say, well, you're going to have two weeks and then it's weight bearing two weeks and then you'll be able to start jogging. You're like, right, I'll make that 10 days. I'll make that 10 days. Like, is that is that is that the constant game? Of course, 100 percent. And you in some ways as an athlete, you've all, you, you're always trying to push for sooner than than what the physio says. You know, it's like oh, you, you're out for. 10 months, for example, and you're like, nah, nah, I'll be back in eight. I'll be back in eight. I'll be back in eight. As, mm-hmm. as, as most athletes, because that's our job. That's, that's what we love doing. Um, and in, in some cases, um, you know, that, that isn't the best thing to be. Um, I, I learned certainly at the early stages of, of my rehab that I was probably pushing it too hard. I was going a step ahead of where I, need, uh, of, of where I was. Um, and, and that can knock you back two steps. So it's vitally important that, um, you, you know, you follow your instructions to the letter to make sure you're in the right place moving forward. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and inevitably, you know, Griff will will take your side of that because they are going to be desperate to come back. Is there any kind of under promise, over deliver from you in managing that expectation? <laughs> no, I, I think certainly it just it has to be sort of um, realistic um, and and also evidence based and and, and goals driven and objectively goals driven. Uh, when when sort of tip I'd i sort of give any aspiring sort of physios is is the key really of a part of your subjective assessment. And I remember someone mentioned this to me years ago, and it always stuck with me: the importance of asking what the next target is for that individual, um, and what the next goal is. Um, because perhaps you know whether it's seeing someone in the clinic who are signed up to do a marathon, perhaps for charity in eight weeks, but they're, they're, they're struggling with a patella tendinopathy as an example, uh, but they've raised 20,000 pounds for charity. That, well, that is their goal. What, what can we now do to, to help them achieve that goal? So sometimes you have to push the boundaries and it's the same in professional sport. There may be cup finals, there may be world cups that you have to try and push the envelope, but as much as possible, it's important to be sort of very objective with, with our decision-making um, you know, there, there are several sort of papers out there and, and, and literature out there that would highlight sort of, you know, healing times and, and average return to play. For example, I know there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good paper um, sort of in, in football that highlights sort of return to play times averages in, in sort of UEFA, big UEFA clubs, basically, um, in terms of quad and hamstring tears, for example. So it's important to have a grasp of those type of numbers because actually once you know really what the goal standard would be and we know what the goals of that individual will be, then it can help, help us plan. 
And if we come into sort of plan a rehabilitation process, it's probably doing it backwards is, is the way forward. So if we know, know for example, with that eight week turnaround for the marathon, we are thinking, right, that's our target. Now we set that target. What have we got to do week on week leading up to that to, 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 to help that person achieve that target? And working backwards probably is, is the best way to do that. You'll soon, it'll soon become apparent then if, if it's unrealistic or, or realistic. I think the key thing when, de when dealing with elite athletes is, is managing the expectations of both, well, the athletes and the coaches. And, and I guess in, in that sense, you, your processes have got to be bang on and spot on. People don't like changes. People don't like to be delayed. Um, and, and, and therefore, having a real good grasp of the, of the theory is, is really, really important when, when, when planning at, at this level, certainly. Yeah. Okay. And, and do you find, Griff, that, that you're under pressure from coaches in, in, at the elite level to say, you know, you, you, you've just told me it's, he's going to be 12 weeks. I need him back in 10 because we've got a semi-final. Or, or, you know, how, how much does that end up playing a part? Certainly, I, I've, I've been very lucky where I've worked, uh, the, that I've worked with very, very reasonable sort of coaches um, and I haven't, haven't been in that situation too, too often. Certainly, you know, it does happen. And and at and the end of the day, we, we understand that, you know, we, we're, we're performance physios. We're here to, to facilitate a performance sport. And we understand the boys are here to play rugby. However, it's, it's how we best sort of, the, the, the approach that we must take is we must obviously try and, and, and hit our targets. And, and if they are accelerated, then, you know, we, we try and, and do our best. But it has to be done in a very safe, um, medical legally tight um, way and, and the, the possesses no risk for further deterioration, breakdown of injury, or puts the player um, or the team, therefore, at, at further risk. So certainly, th th this is one of the most challenging aspects of being a physio. And like I said, for, for aspiring physios, I'd really, really encourage, if there's one thing so, so thought-provoking sort of factors from, from this evening, is go away and really know, understand what sort of healing times look like, um, what, what sort of average times out of, from, from certain injuries looks like and, and really start getting together some nice processes in terms of nice spreadsheets, nice planning sort of materials to, to help make that decision. And, 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 and ultimately, the, the more goal-driven, the more objective your, your, your goals can be um, will just help you make a very informed process when it comes down to sort of allowing that individual to play safely. Yeah. Okay. And it's interesting. I mean, ultimately, whether you've got to answer to a boss or not, it's it's pretty clear from what you say that. But morally, what you're ultimately trying to do is get someone back to full fitness as quickly, but as safely as possible. So it's it's no silver bullet in that regard, is it? No, certainly, certainly. And and, and that is that, that is the absolute critical um, sort of you know take home messages. The physios, and we see this on field, you know, they see the physios coming on and they're thinking, oh, I don't want to be taken off. And, and you know, you explain to the players, we want you to stay on. We want you guys to come back as quick as you can. Of course we do. But we want you to come back and, and come back to perform, not just to play. It's the easiest thing in the world is to allow someone to come back two weeks early and play rubbish and move around the park very slow and not have their speed, etc. Be, you know, have a rubbish performance that might affect mental health, let the team down, etc. That's not what we want to do. We want to, when we make our decisions to allow someone come, to come back to play, we want to be certain that they're going to perform well, that they're not going to break down, uh, and, and, and that it's safe for the athlete and is the best thing for the athlete and the team. So, Josh, how does that affect things in terms of your patience as an athlete when you feel ready to go, but you might be 70% ready to go rather than 100 I think Chris just made a, a great point with making sure the athlete is ready to perform is, is probably the key word there for me. You know, the athlete could be ready to play probably two, three weeks prior, but ready to perform at the level that's required to benefit the team um, is, is massive. And, you know, that, that might take an extra two, three weeks to make sure he's at that level. Um, so I thought that was a great point that, that Griff made there. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the physical demands of professional rugby then, you know, whether you're coming back from injury or, or training week in, week out, just I don't know, give us a bit of an insight. What, what, what is it like out, out there? Um, I think I get a quite lucky playing on the wing, maybe avoid uh, a little bit co uh, of contact as, as what the forwards do. But um, 
it's it's certainly strenuous. It, it, it's tough work. Um, you know, you, your body more or less is having a small car crash every big hit. You know, um, there's certain data now that players wear behind their neck, uh, behind their ear, on the on their upper neck. If you've seen it, I think Newcastle might wear it in the Premiership. Um, there's a scientific study going on to measure the force of impacts that players are taking throughout the game. Um, it also helps with some studies with uh, concussion as well. And, and, and the impacts the lads are taking are, are like a small car crash. So your body is, is getting battered, um, especially when the games come thick and fast, even more so when you step up to international level. Um, and, you know, having a, a strong medical team be around you as, is, is vital to make sure that you're doing the right things to perform again um, the following week and the following week to, to keep on playing well. Um, and I found a, a massive help of the Blues that I've been guided in the right direction. And um, I'm, I'm very fortunate for that. Yeah, good, good. We'll uh, keep up the good work, obviously. Um, we have got uh, plenty of questions coming in. And uh, and I think, you know, Griff, I was, I was going to move on to, obviously, your work in high performance, as we've talked about. But you know, given the limited number of jobs in that field compared to, to getting into others, perhaps across the wider profession. Um, I think we've got a few questions from people about, you know, finding their pathway in there. So uh, we have, let me just see, um, we've got a couple of anonymous questions, actually. But um, yeah, um, what advice would you give to current university students who perhaps would want to work in professional rugby clubs? Um, and then uh, another one, what are elite clubs looking for when hiring sports therapists and physiotherapists? Yeah, it's a real good question. It's one we sort of get asked quite quite often. Um, I think really what, what we're looking for, I guess, is looking for the right, well, one of my sort of priorities would if if recruiting is looking for the right type of person. So um, the right type of person to fit into the environment that would work well with athletes, gain rapport, um, have a sound sort of self-awareness and 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 good understanding of of where they fit in the, the you know the, the cog in the in the, in the big wheel. Um, certainly, for me personally, and, and and one thing that I really try and sort of drive with others I work with is is the importance really to be reflective and 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 like I mentioned earlier, that that growth mindset is absolutely imperative. Like it doesn't matter if you've sort of worked in sport for two two months or or twenty five years. Um, you it's never you know a bit of a cliche, but it's never too late to, in terms of learning. And you'll always always got to critically reflect what what you're doing and 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 grow and improve. Um, and and that's what you've got to do to strive for excellence. So certainly those are the sort of traits that I'd be looking at. Someone who had that sound self um, awareness and that ability to, to to critically sort of reflect. Um, with with regard to advice on certain pathways, um, for, it's a really it's a really interesting question. The, the best advice I would give is 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 trying to really figure out where you want to be, sort of, and which direction you want to be in, because um, physio, as as we know, is is, a, is such a wide scope, of, and and sports therapy, sorry, is such a it's such a wide scope of 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 things that we can do. And, and, and particularly say for, for if, if, if rugby is, is what you're after, is getting involved in your local side and, and, and basically getting exposure to week, on, uh, week in, week out sort of rugby, um, you know, the, the runnings of a rugby club, getting to know the, the lads, building, um, you know, relationships, et cetera. Making mistakes, um, you know, certainly is a, is a big, big part of it. And, and, and that's what the, the, the most sort of fundamental thing is get in, in, in involved. You might find that actually you don't enjoy it and actually that it, is, it isn't for you. But, but certainly you need to get involved on a, at the bottom of a ladder that you, you want to climb. From a qualification point then, um, you know, there are postgraduate courses that would be advantageous and, and certainly, um, you know, there, there, there are certain jobs that, that you can't apply for without a, a master's, for example. So that's mm -hmm. definitely something to consider. However, it's not the be all and end all either. Um, so I, I think in the, the bottom line is, is, is getting the ex experience and exposure at, a, at an early level, but get, get yourself on the bottom of a ladder that you want to climb. Find out who who sort of would you like to learn from, um, and try and, and you know approach them and, and and message them whether it's on LinkedIn or email and and see whether you can do some experience with them etc. And, and get get that exposure. That that be my advice. 
Yeah, excellent. It's certainly similar to, to, to the advice I give when people ask me about broadcast. Find, find the shortest route to starting to do it. And, and, and do it locally or whatever, and then uh, and then hopefully it moves on from there. Um, Marianne Sharp has uh, put in a question just related to something you mentioned a short while ago, Griff. Uh, can you give any links uh, to the papers on healing on healing times? Uh, maybe maybe I'm able to give them right here right now, but um, but certainly I can I can certainly dig them out, and um, we'll get we'll get the guys to send them out later. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Okay, that would be great. Um, and uh, and then sort of to uh, you know you've covered obviously the what you would want in this in the staff and, and and how people sort of find their way there um josh from your point of view you've obviously will have worked with a with some medical teams with worcester and with with uh, with cardiff blues and at the welsh union um what do you like in your medical staff is it the biscuits in the room <laughs> uh, unfortunately there's no biscuits in the blues <laughs> um which would be nice actually so uh, yeah. that, you know that that could be a little nice addition um yeah, i course. think i think when you uh, a player it's the person you know what sort of person is 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 uh is the physio you know if you can sort of get on with each other you know you, you want to be comfortable around him you want because you want to be honest with him about how you're feeling you never want to come in there and, and hide anything you need to be really honest with um with the physio so having a good relationship and and, and what sort of person they are is, is massive for the athlete point of view um that, that we can just come in openly and just tell him straight how it is because that way it's going to work better for both of us. He knows exactly how I'm feeling, what's going on with me, and I and I don't need to hide anything from him. Um, and and especially when you're injured, to be able to be able to you know sometimes you're in the treatment room five days a week, a cumulative of maybe you know six seven hours depends on on what sort of injury you got. To be able just to have a normal conversation, be able to tell him what happened on the weekend, you know, ask him about his family. Him asking, uh, him asking the athlete about theirs, having that relationship um, is is massive. And I think as soon as that relationship is is in place, and the athlete and the physio um, are are working in tandem, then the rehab process becomes a lot smoother. Yeah, excellent. Um, we've had uh, had a question come in, which uh, which Josh, I'll follow up with you on. Um, but it's it's probably relevant for both of you, um, or maybe more so, Griff. But it's interesting. Ella Trot asks, "How do you manage niggles or small aches and pains when games are weekly, and when different niggles could take one week or ten weeks to sort out?" Um, Josh, I'll just let you pick up on that first, and then we'll come to Griff. Okay. Um, yeah. So. There's obviously various different, me- um, you know, recovery methods that we, we all go through as, as a squad um, from from week to week. You know, having constant soft tissue, I think, is has been a massive benefit for myself. Um, you know, some boys prefer to do it on their own, maybe a foam roll or a stretch. But the, the soft tissue stuff, I find, really helps um, to sort of stay on top of them little niggles that um, I could pick up. And then your your usual recovery process. So, you know, um, into some sort of recovery tight leggings, anything like this, just to get them little one percenters. Ice baths, I know they're absolutely horrible. I hate it, like majority of the players, but they're so beneficial, um, it, you know, especially post-match and during the week. Um, you know, if, if you're not a fan of just being in ice, you can do a hot, cold sort of contrast, two minutes in either, maybe four or five times. That also works pretty well. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's, it's really staying proactive. You know, there's only in some ways there's only so much the physio can do to sort of stay with you on them niggles. You know, he can treat you, he can guide you, he can he can show you things to do. But ultimately, with niggles like that, you know, it's it's really on to the player um, to to do them things to stay on top. Oh, he's a dream, isn't he, Griff? He's saying all the right things here. Very impressive. Um, <laughs> Yes, and 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 like honestly, going back to that point I made earlier, is is this, these are some of the reasons why Josh will have made it to the top, apart from obviously his his, his raw talent. But it, it's no coincidence at all. Um, for me, really, it, it, it this is where the physios earn their earn their money in terms of of the the week on week grind, how to keep people going when really we know the best thing for them is to is to deload. The key to this is is ensuring that we look at it that uh, as as what can we do rather than what we what do we don't do um, in, in a sense? So it's again, it's, it's that matter of being proactive. Really, is when someone's injured. For example, now if I give you an example of 
someone's got a, a knee injury, um, that week, there's, there's an important game, maybe in a couple of weeks' time. What can they do this week that will help them get there in a couple of weeks' time? So instead of thinking, oh, I need to rest, and, and, and especially this is, this is um, more aimed perhaps towards a sort of grassroots level, et cetera, but rather than thinking, oh, we need to offload them, they need to just do nothing, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, well, how are they going to condition? Okay, so they need to keep fit for the game in a couple of weeks' time. So can they swim? Can they put a float between the legs, allow them to swim? Can they do a ski erg? Can they do upper body conditioning using battle ropes? Can they do upper body strength work? Can they, can they do um, strength work on the other side? Because actually it's only the right leg that's injured. What can they do on the left? And then trying to find the, the, what, what exercises work, you know, what, what can we do on the right this week to, to, to help them? Cognitively, if, if it's a big game, what are they doing cognitively to make them better in a couple of weeks? Are they, are they looking through the analysis of last week's game? Are they thinking tactically? Are they helping the team with presentations in terms of, you know, um, helping coaches in terms of pre preparation? Are they reading up about the opponents, et cetera, et cetera? And then you're looking at the other pillars that Josh has mentioned in terms of the recovery pillars, such as, you know, there's nothing better than the nutrition and sleep. You know, are they getting adequate sleep? Are they getting that, the, the, the nutrition? Are they, are they very, very disciplined in terms of what they're eating through that period? Some lads, as, as we know, so sort of enjoy eating more than perhaps the others. Um, and, and therefore, can we identify certain um, potential problematic um, athletes that may be actually, that may balloon if, if they don't, if they aren't kept on the straight and narrow? So certainly it's, it's coming up with buckets of solutions to allow them to do things rather than preventing them from, from doing other things that they shouldn't in that sense. Yeah, excellent. Um, well, we are with, uh, with uh, Griff and with Josh for just about another 10 minutes. So uh, whether you're watching via Facebook or YouTube or here via the webinar, um, do get a question or two in. Um, we will just come to each of the gentlemen to kind of find a little bit more about what a typical day looks like, uh, which I think will cover a few of the questions that have already come in. Um, and, uh, and we've got another couple of, uh, of questions that are a little bit more um, specific in their own nature, which I'll, I'll just cover one or two of those first, if I may. Um, I think Griff, these are like to be coming more to you um but uh, let me just see uh where are we um afonso martins asks do you carry any well-being questionnaires for players um and if you do would you be able to give any examples of the sort of things you look for um certainly from from my point at the at the blues i i do a lot of the long-term rehabilitation um side of things and certainly we're with like a, like a, like I mentioned in the rehabilitation process, the psychologist is heavily heavily involved with that. Certainly, when I would return an individual to back to play, um, we would really look at their their sort of mental state before they come back in into to compete. Um, for example, questionnaires such as the the um, Tampa Canis phobia sort of questionnaire or the IKDC sort of knee questionnaire, the ACL, RSI questionnaire. These are all sort of questionnaires that look at the well-being and the psychological readiness for a turn to play with an individual. And those examples of particular following knee injury. So that certainly plays a huge, huge part of our, our decision making. Um, and that's just one example. There, there, there are lots of other examples out there, but, but, but certainly... Um, that, that side of things, the psychology and the, the cognitive we and, and well-being of the individual is certainly um, at the centre of our focus here at the Blues and, and within the Welsh Rugby Union wide, wider umbrella. Yeah, OK, great. Um, well, uh, before we come on to a, a couple more questions, then, Josh, um, give us an idea as to, as to what a typical day might look like for you and, and perhaps how that might involve the support from the medical team. Yeah, so, you know, Usually the first thing we do uh, when we arrive at the club in the morning is, is we have monitoring um, or medical screening, as some clubs might call it, where there's um, certain tests that the lads do every morning, um, whether we do an abductor squeeze, we do a grip strength, we do a sit and reach for your hamstrings. Um, and um, we jot all these into, uh, into a laptop or an iPad or, or whatever they have. Um, and, and we write the scores in. And if anything flags up below your baseline um, scores, then that, that message gets sent straight to the physios and, and that's flagged up with them. So then 
they, they, they will approach you or, or you go to them if, if, if you're feeling anything. And, and that conversation starts at the beginning of the day. So that's before we've done mm. anything. And then, as you mentioned on questionnaires, there's usually three questions underneath all your scores, and that's readiness to train, sleep quality, and muscle soreness. So 10 being, you, this is the best you've ever felt in your life. One being, I'm struggling to walk. So you jot them scores in, and I think anything really below, five or below, questions start to be asked, you know, sleep-wise. It could be anything, you know, people might have... Um, Young children in the house, you know, they've been sleepless or anything in, in that reason. But it's good for people to know because if anything comes up later in the day, they can always refer back to being. I think we may have just lost the audio on. Uh... And that's when you can talk to the physios maybe about um, managing your sessions, managing your weight sessions with being really so lower body. So maybe taking a load off or a set off on, on, on your lower body weights. So that's usually the first thing we do. And then it's, it's sort of, it runs pretty smoothly then with weights usually followed um, by a bit of food and then you're into your field sessions then in the afternoon. Very good. Excellent rundown. Um, and, uh, and what about the kind of pre-season testing side of it? Um, how, does, how does that work? Um, I mean, I guess, Josh, we could get your insight on it, but, but I guess, uh, is that a part that you would be involved in, Griff? Yeah, certainly. Pre-season um, is a really busy time for us as physios. Um, you know, on the, with the lads coming back in, we'd always screen them back in medically. Um, that's exploring sort of subjectively how, how they're feeling. Um, you know, has they, have they had any issues whilst they're away? Because, you know, with, the, with it being generally a five-week break, we haven't seen them for a, for a long, long time. Thing, anything could, could have happened in that time. That's followed by a good objective sort of screen. And we go through a big uh, sort of checklist, head to toe, making sure we're not missing anything. Um, so that would be certainly in the first few days pre-season. Um, pre-season is, 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 is a critical one, really. The medical team and, and strength and conditioning work collaboratively to, to, to get that right. Because pre-season time for any sport is a time where people do break down, like t soft tissues get injured. People have increasing groin injuries, for example. Um, so it's getting that load correct. And what I mean by load is, is, is the, the amount of volume that the, the individuals may be running or the, 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 the gym weight training that they may be doing in the gym, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that would be a huge, huge injury prevention strategy that we, we'd have probably done what we're, we're looking at doing right now. So before the end of that, that current season. From a testing point of view, um, it, it's, that's our time to get some baseline tests in. And those baseline tests are critical then um, to, to help us with, the, with the, the tests that I mentioned earlier, these objective markers. So we can, we can compare um, you know, a pre-season baseline versus what they may have when they try before, you know, playing the semi-final, um, and you know, th th those kind of numbers then help guide our decision and make a, an informed decision. So th those type of tests will will vary. We we look at um, hamstring strength, we look at groin strength, we look at maybe flexibility, endurance, capacity of muscles, um, some hop hop tests even to, to to look in terms of their um, proprioceptive control and landing ability. And there's a whole batch of things that we we would do. And, we, and, and it's there really to help us in, 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 in the future in terms of making correct uh, and accurate decisions, really. Yeah, OK. And uh, I've got a great question here from, uh, from Lucy for you, Josh. Um, it's, uh, it touches on a, on a few of the things you've talked about already, but uh, it says, uh, as a player, what drives you to do your prehab and injury prevention? I feel like some players have a lack of motivation to engage in these, and then by the time they have, they're injured and it's too late. So, uh, so where does your motivation uh, and, uh, and drive come from to, to do it? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, I... For me, it's personally just to get better on field. I think the more I do off the field, the better it's going to benefit me on the field. So that's the, that's the main motivator for me is the more I'm on the field performing, the better chance of me um, going to another level, as in playing-wise or achieving another goal, um, you know, international-wise or beyond. So that's what really motivates me is staying fit, of course, but really, I know that what I'm doing is going to benefit me on field. And as a rugby player, why wouldn't you do anything that was going to benefit your performance? So that's the motivation, I would say, for myself. Yeah, excellent stuff. Now, uh, 
I can, uh, we, we heard from, uh, from Josh as to how that day looks from his perspective. I mean, uh, Griff, we've had a couple of people uh, asking, I know Lukash was asking uh, how a sort of physio routine program looks at the club, um, whether, um, you know, in terms of prevention of injury, after training, massages, theory with players, warm up, kind of how long those kind of things work out. Can you uh, give us a, a little bit of insight as to that? Yeah, well, I, I... Yeah, it, it, it's, it's quite a um, sort of comprehensive process we, we, we adopt. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we, we will have um, this five full-time physios working within, within the club. Um, and we'll also have some um, soft tissue therapy support as well to help, help with recovery. And generally, the, the soft tissue therapists will, will be working sort of post-sessions um, at, the, at the end of sort of playing days. Um, or, or sometimes in between training, um, as well as obviously the physiotherapy. Our, our input is often manual therapy based um, on the plinth, whether it's doing mobilizations um, or, or soft tissue treatments. From a point of um, our sort of preventative prehabilitation stuff, the, the, the lads will have um, individualized preparation plans and prehabilitation plans based generally on their past medical history, um, as well as potential um, niggles that might be persisting as the season goes on. And they will have that responsibility really in an activation session. There's an hour uh, every, every morning that the lads will be expected to be in there. And, uh, and actually, there's a, we, we take a register of, of who's in there um, when and where, and there will be consequences if, if they aren't in there. And that's just to encourage um, the, the lads to be in there. And I'll be honest, the Blues, there the probably isn't a need for, for, for the registration. The, the, the players are very, very proactive because um, they've, they've probably been educated so much. It's been hammered home so, so often for them. But, but certainly that would take part in the mornings. And what we tend to do in the afternoons then, um, be, on a, a post sort of what we call red day, so the intense rugby session of the week, generally would, with it being a Tuesday if it was a Saturday game, so that's before a day off, mm -hmm. then they, they would get some heavier loading type uh, preventative strategies. So if I give you one example, perhaps that's where um, the uh, Nord, Nordics, uh, so two sets of four, two sets of five of, of Nordics may, may take place, for example, for the hamstring. Well, that's maybe where an individual may heavily load uh, a patella tendon or an Achilles tendon. Um, so th those, those type of things happen on a, on a Tuesday at the end of the day with the recovery day then following on the Wednesday. And that, that week sort of matches up quite well. And, and we've, we're, we're having very good, good sort of results with, with that model. And can I just ask, would you use, uh, Robert's asked this question, how much would you make use of GPS data when analysing um, either those sessions or any return to play programmes? Oh, absolutely massively. Um, the GPS is, is, is a part of a bigger process. Um, and certainly with, if I talk specifically at the long-term process, before an individual come back, comes back to play or sort of in the mid stages or, or certainly periodically throughout rehab, we will look to take these objective markers um, and GPS is, 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 is one of those. So before an individual returns to play, we want them to be able to demonstrate really that they're able to run um, at least within 90% of their sort of pre-injury high speed volume, as, uh, I'm sorry, high speed velocity as, as one example. And we'd also be expecting really for, for their sort of training volumes to match up with what they were doing before injury. Um, it, it varies and there's no specific blueprint, but certainly a, a general rule of thumb, if I was to say for sort of more grassroots level that I've used in the past is if an individual sort of out for around sort of six weeks mark or, or below um, four to six weeks, then they, what I tend to want really is a week of full training before they come back in. If it was sort of six weeks to 12 weeks, then you'd be looking really, especially closer to 12, you're looking for a couple of weeks before they come back in. And beyond that, beyond 12, really, they're looking for, you know, two to three weeks of training before coming back in. And, and that, that would be of to, to ensure that their GPS volumes are high enough. But also in rugby, we've got a burden of contact so that, that we've, they've got enough preparation in the tank, really, mm. to, to, to allow them to come back safe. To, to prevent further injury or breakdown from, from occurring. Great. There's, uh, there's an acronym here I don't know, I'm afraid. So I'm going to ask a question from Jay. Do you ever make use of HRV monitoring? Is that heart rate? Heart rate variability. Um, we, cool. 
<laughs> so um, certainly in the past, um, at England Sevens, uh, worked with a clinician, Dan Howells, who would, who would take heart rate variability um, daily. And I believe they, they, they still do and they still are in GB camp right now, I would expect so. Um, he's, a, he's a big data, data guy, Dan, and um, use it, uses it a lot. And, and actually quite remarkably um, powerful at, at predicting illnesses. That's what I found when I was on the seven circuit. Oh, wow. um, so certainly very powerful, certainly, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Well, um, look, we uh, we are just over uh, seven o'clock, so uh, we will wrap it up in just a second. Um, there was a very early question that came through uh, from uh, from Paul Fisk, and maybe this is playing on his mind. Maybe he uh, he needs to look after the elder statesmen and athletes around him. Says, would your recovery protocols change for older vets players, e.g., fifty plus? <laughs> I think I think the key is 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 getting your, those pillars right. I think if you if you get your sleep right, you get your nutrition right, and just bit of a uh, bit of common sense and a sensible approach, I think uh, you'll be absolutely fine. Excellent common sense approach, um, Josh. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, I imagine uh, it's a tense time being a rugby player in the home unions with a certain Lions tour and some some selection on the cards over the next next week or so. Yeah, you know. What will be will be, as they say. So um, I'm, I'm sitting patiently and uh, fingers crossed in it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we wish you the very, very best of luck and uh, and thank you very much for joining us, Chris. Thank you as well. Some great insight there, no doubt, for everybody who uh, who were either aspiring or currently practising or looking to get uh, into uh, into the elite game. Thank you very much for your time. No thank problem you. at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. So, uh, so thank you, everybody. We hope that there's plenty in there for you. Um, our thanks to Physique Management, of course, as well, um, who have been uh, yeah, supporting the, uh, the injury management scene for over 20 years in various sports. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope that, uh, that you have got plenty from this session. Um, but for now, um, I think that will just about wrap us up. So uh, again, my thanks to Josh, um, my thanks to Griff. Uh, my, I've been Nick Heath and uh, enjoy the rest of your Thursday evening. Um, we'll see you again soon. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.